Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Let's Read of Flush. All right, in the last part, um, Abby got in trouble, and at that point, even the dad gave up trying to nail Dusty Muleman. But the kids haven't given up yet. They're trying to take things into their own hands. All right, let's get back to the book. Chapter 13. Dad was serious about getting serious. The same morning he was released from jail, he went out and got himself hired by a company called Tropical Rescue. It wasn't the sort of work that my father could put his heart into, but I knew why he took the job. It was the boat. They'd let him use a 24-foot outboard with a T-top and twin 150s. Not for fishing, but for towing in tourists who got ran out of gas or rammed their boats aground. Normally, my father has no patience for these sorts of bumblers. He calls them Googans, or even worse, depending on what kind of fix they've gotten themselves into. But Dad needed the job, so he buttoned his lip and kept his opinions to himself. Unless it's a life or death emergency, the Coast Guard refers to disabled boat calls to private contractors like Tropical Rescue, which charge big bucks. They stay busy, too. It's amazing how many people are too lazy to read a fuel gauge, a compass, or a marine chart. They just point their boats at the horizon and go. All around the keys, you can see the propeller trenches, long, ugly gouges like giant fingernail scrapes along the tidal banks. It takes years for the seagrass to go back. Dad's first rescue job was a boatload of software salesmen from Orlando who were stranded all the way out at Nine Mile Bank. Somehow they managed to beach a brand new bay liner on a flat that was only four inches deep. That's not easy to do unless you're bombed and wearing a blindfold. Miraculously, Dad restrained himself from saying anything insulting. He didn't get mad, he didn't make fun of the bonehead who'd been driving the boat. No, my father, the new and improved Payne Underwood, stayed calm and polite. He waited patiently for the tide to come up, tugged the bayliner off the bank, and towed it back to Halusa Cove. He told us he almost felt sorry for the software salesman when he handed them the bill, which didn't even include the hefty fine from the park service for trashing the seagrass. It was probably the most expensive vacation those guys ever had. Even though Dad didn't like dealing with Googans, he was ten times happier on the water than he was driving a taxi. That meant the mom was in a better mood too, laughing and kidding around the, the way that she used to. The two of them were getting along so well that Abby and I were extra careful not to mention the sticky subject of Dusty Muleman's casino boat. We discussed our new plan of attack only when we were alone and away from the house where our parents couldn't hear us. A couple days after my father got out of jail, the parks department took down the pollution warnings at Thunder Beach. The next morning, Abby and I put on our bathing suits and grabbed a couple of towels and dashed outside. Mom and Dad figured we were heading for the park, which is exactly what we wanted them to think. Because we were really going to Shelly's trailer. We had to knock a half a dozen times. When she finally came to the door, she didn't seem especially delighted to see us. Her eyes were puffy and half-closed, and it looked like somebody had set up a firecracker in her hair. Time is it? She asked hoarsely. 7.30, I said. She winced. A.M.? You gotta be kidding me. Abby said, it's important. Please? We followed Shelly inside. She sagged onto the sofa and tucked her legs up under her catty pink bathrobe. Killer headache, she explained, running her tongue across her front teeth. Large party last night. She was clearly in pain, so we got right to the point. We need your help, I said. Now. To do what? To stop Dusty Muleman. You promised, remember? She laughed, a tired, what was I thinking sort of laughs. She looked across at Abby, and you promised to keep your big brother out of trouble. And we won't get into any trouble, Abby said evenly, if you help us. It seemed like Shelly was having second thoughts. I wondered if she really was afraid of Dusty Muleman after all. In a discouraged voice, she said, I don't know what we can do to stop him. He's tied with all the big shots in town. Yeah, but he's poisoning Thunder Beach, I said. Do you know how sick a kid could get from swimming in the bad water? Same goes for the fish and dolphins and baby turtles. It sucks what Dusty's doing. It's awful. Yeah, but, and don't forget about what happened to Lice, I added. Remember how he told me that you had a dog in this fight? Remember, Lice is exactly what I've been thinking about. Shelly cut in. Say they really killed him, okay? You really think they'd hesitate to do the same to me or you if something goes wrong? It was about time she got worried, and who could blame her? She was right about Lice being dead, then Dusty and Luna were cold-blooded murderers. But one glance and I knew Abby wouldn't back off, no matter what the risks. Neither could I. Alright, uh, the following part, um, like, a little bit of the following section of book was on the back of the first copy of Flesh I've ever seen. Shelly, I know it's dangerous, not to mention crazy, she said. Yeah, and probably crazy, I agreed. Look, if you don't want to be a part of this, it's okay, I understand. She shut her eyes and rolled back her head. Uh-oh, here comes the guilt. 
She pressed her knuckles to her ears. Enough already, Noah. This poor blonde head's about to explode. Shelly stretched out on the sofa. Abby got some ice cubes from the refrigerator and wrapped them in a dish towel, which Shelly gingerly positioned across her brow. After a minute or two of muffled moaning, she said, Guess I wasn't feeling so brave when I got up this morning, but hey, a promise is a promise. Count me in. Abby and I looked at each other, happy with relief. So, what's the big plan? Shelly asked. And how does your daddy fit in? He doesn't fit in. We're not going to tell him about it. Abby replied. Shelly opened one bloodshot eye and studied us. That's probably a darn good idea, she said, but it'll still be blamed for everything if we get caught, I pointed out. That's why we need you. Shelly sighed. So let's hear it. When we told her our plan, she didn't laugh or make fun. She just lay there, thinking. Well, Abby said impatiently. Shelly levered herself upright, balancing the ice pack on her forehead. This idea of yours is so whacked, she said. It just might work. Does that mean you'll help us? And all I gotta do is flush? She asked. That's it? That's all you've gotta do, I said. Flush and flush often. Name drop. That's like a super name drop right there. The next thing that happened was all my fault. I wasn't paying attention. Abby and I were riding home slowly along the old highway, talking about the Coral Queen when somebody rushed up on us from behind. Before I could wheel around, Jasper Muehlman Jr. grabbed my bike and Bull grabbed Abby's, and together they dragged us backwards into a strand of Australian pines. Not again, I thought in a panic. It wasn't me I was frightened for. It was my sister. No sooner had Jasper Jr. knocked me to the ground when I heard Bull let loose a spine-chilling wail. Instantly, I knew what had happened. He'd been too careless with Abby. Make her let go! Jasper Jr. hollered at me. I can't. Jasper Jr. jerked me to my feet. Underwood, if you don't make her let go of Bull, I will snap you like a twig. Bull kept on wailing. Abby had sunk her teeth into his left earlobe and was hanging on like a starved alligator. Bull was at least a foot taller than her, so he had to be very careful to not pull away or else he just might lose the ear. Whenever he moved even a little bit, his wailing got louder. That boy was in serious pain. Make her stop, Jasper Jr. demanded. He's bleeding, man, can't you see? Abby, is Bull really bleeding? I asked. She nodded, causing Bull to crank up the volume. It was pitiful to hear. Jasper Jr. started throttling me by the shoulders. Make her quit, Underwood. Make her stop. One condition, I said. You guys let her go. Jasper Jr. sneered his famous sneer. How about this for a condition, dork brain? Your sister quits chewing up Bull or else will start pounding your head with a ripe coconut. Bull managed to calm himself down long enough to offer his own opinion. The girl takes her teeth out of my ear. She walks. You got my promise, Underwood. Hey, no way, Jasper Jr. began to protest. You shut up, Bull snapped. He was looking at us with his thick neck bent towards the ground and his head positioned sideways to give Abby as much slack as possible. Considering the delicate situation, she seemed calm. I didn't see any blood, but there was no reason to inform Bull that he wasn't really bleeding to death. So guys, we have a deal or not? I asked. Deal, Bull grunted. Yeah, whatever, said Jasper Jr., spearing me with a bony elbow. All right then, I said. Abby, you can let go now. Mm-mm, she said through a mouthful of ear. Come on, let go of Bull. Mm-mm. You want to catch some gross disease? He probably hasn't had a bath since Christmas, I said. Even that didn't make her quit. I knew why, too. She didn't want to leave me out there alone with the two of them. Honest, I'll be okay, I said, which must have sounded incredibly lame. She knew I wasn't going to be okay. She knew they were going to stomp me into hamburger meat. Uh-uh, my sister said emphatically. Abby, come on! There was no way I was going to let her stay here in the woods. Jasper Jr. was a vicious punk who wouldn't think twice about beating up a girl half his size. Bull said, I think I'm going to hurl. Abby chomped down harder, and the noise that came out of Bull didn't even sound human. Jasper jumped me again and put me in a headlock. Now listen, you little brat, he snapped at my sister. We're going to do this my way. I will break your brother's neck if you don't spit out Bull's ear by the count of three. There was no response from Abby, but now I saw true fear in her eyes. My face must have looked like a tomato that was about to explode as hard as Jasper Jr. was clenching down on me. I couldn't tell my sister what to do next because I couldn't even squeak out a word. One, said Jasper Jr. Abby hung on. Two, Abby wasn't budging. Two, Jasper Jr. barked again. I tried to wriggle free, but it was no use. Jasper Jr.'s forearm was locked tight against my throat, and it hurt to breathe. Everything in front of me was starting to get fuzzy and dark, and I figured that I was about to pass out. The next words I heard were, 
Try two and a half, shorty. The voice sounded too old and gravelly to be Jasper Jr., but I assumed that my hearing was just messed up because all the oxygen had been squeezed out of my brain. Let him go, the voice said again, and it clearly wasn't speaking to Abby. It was speaking to Jasper, who, to my complete surprise, immediately let me go. I fell to the ground and stayed on all fours until I caught my breath. You all right, Noah? It lifted my eyes up in bewilderment. The old voice belonged to a lanky, long-haired man with woolly, silvery hair. A gleaming gold coin hung from a tarnished chain around his neck. His craggy face looked like a mahogany stump. On one tan cheek was a scar in the shape of a letter M. Anybody could see that this guy was old and tough. Shirtless and barefoot, he leaned casually against the trunk of a tall pine. His weather-beaten cutoffs had been bleached gray by the sun, and a dirty red bandana was knotted around his right wrist. The curly hair on his bare chest was as shiny as the hair on his head. Jasper Jr. isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he knew that the stranger meant business. We were only joking around, he said timidly. That right. The old pirate smiled in a way that caused Jasper Jr. to go pale. Bull whimpered like a puppy, but didn't say anything. The stranger turned to my sister. Now it's your turn, Abby. How about you let go of that boy? My sister's eyes got wide at the sound of her name. She released her grip on Bull's ear, stepped back, and then began spitting vigorously into the bushes. Bull straightened up and pressed a fist against his throbbing ear, trying to staunch the bleeding that wasn't even happening. Who are you? I asked the old man. How do you even know our names? He brushed past me and went up to Jasper Jr., who looked like he desperately needed a bathroom. You ever bother these two kids again? The old man warned him, and you will dearly regret it. Comprende? Jasper Jr. nodded shakily. Bull was actually an inch or so taller than the pirate, but it didn't help him. The guy walked over and got square in the face. Pretty summer day, you can't think of anything better to do than to hassle some kids. You're flat out pathetic, son. Helpless? She nearly took off my ear! I'd say you got off lucky. The stranger said with a smile. He winked at Abby and me and then jerked a thumb over one shoulder. Y'all run on home. Hurry up now. Who are you? My sister asked. Nobody. And that's the truth. He wasn't kidding around. Now get going, both of you, he said. Me and the boys are going to finish our little chat. Abby and I quickly retrieved our bikes and took off. As soon as we were out of the trees, we started pedaling for home as fast as we could. Have you ever seen that guy before? Abby asked breathlessly. I don't think so. Then how did he know our names? How did he know who we were? Was he spying on us or something? He looked dangerous. Noah, do you think he's dangerous? Abby, I honestly don't know. Maybe I should have been creeped out by the strange old pirate, but I wasn't. For some reason, I believed everything he said back there. Except for the part about him being nobody. It was an hour before dark when we got out to the islands called the Cow Pens. They got that name supposedly because Native Americans kept sea cows penned up there a long time ago. Dad tossed the anchor into a deep hole about 200 yards from the main channel. The tropical rescue towboat was much bigger than Dad's bonefish skiff, so there was plenty of room for Mom to ride along. She said yes, too, which is a really nice surprise. She sat on the bow with her back to the sun and snapped pictures of us fishing. Right away, I caught a couple of decent mangrove snappers, and Dad caught a fat keeper grouper. My sister reeled in a pufferfish that blew itself up into a spiny balloon. She said it looked like her fourth grade teacher. Of course, Abby and I didn't mention what had happened that afternoon on the way home from Shelly's trailer. Dad would have taken off after Jasper Jr., and Mom would have gone to the police to tell them about the strange old man. Besides, my father liked things quiet and peaceful when he was out on the water. He didn't like to do too much talking. He said it was disrespectful to nature. After a while, we put away our fishing rods and sat down to wait for the sunset. The sky to the west was mostly clear, except for a few wispy clouds and a long contrail from a big military jet. Dad took a seat up front with Mom, who handed the camera to Abby. I dangled my legs off the starboard gunwale while Rescue was painted in bright orange lettering. A flock of pelicans floated over us in the shape of a V and kept on flying, straight towards the great Gulf of Mexico. A light breeze was blowing from the southeast, rocking the boat just enough to make us a little drowsy. Abby nudged me and cut her eyes towards our parents, who were actually holding hands. Everything felt so good and so right that I had this feeling that we were finally going to get to see the green flash. The evening was perfect for it. Gradually, the sun changed from gold to blazing pink and seemed to turn liquid as it dimpled the horizon. None of us said a word because we didn't want this moment to end. People who have never seen a sunset at sea would be blown away. Time seems to slow down until finally that huge blazing ball looks like it's just hanging there, balanced on the far edge of the earth. But in reality, it's dropping fast. 
As the last rosy crescent melted into the gulf, I felt myself leaning forward, squinting hopefully at the skyline. Then the sun was gone, leaving a pale lemon emptiness. I glanced over at Abby, who was putting the camera away. She smiled and shrugged. Wow, that was gorgeous, my mother whispered. Yeah, said Abby, but no green flash. Maybe next time, my father said, as he always did. I turned my gaze back to the horizon and held it there, even as the rim of pink faded into darkness. I heard Dad hauling in the anchor, Mom zipping her windbreaker, and Abby asking if she could steer back to the dock, but I still couldn't take my eyes off of the sky. Alright, next up is Chapter 14. This is where things start to get really good. Chapter 14. $57.16. That's all Abby and I could scrounge up, and 51 bucks of it was hers. I would have had more if I hadn't bought new skateboard trucks the first week of vacation. You think it's gonna buy enough? Abby asked on the way to the store. It'll have to, I said. I didn't know the exact size of the Coral Queen's holding tank, but I guessed it carried a couple hundred gallons of waste. I also didn't know how much dye we could get for $57.16. Abby led me to the aisle where the food coloring was displayed. Blue won't work, right? Nah, that wouldn't show up, I agreed, scanning the shelves. What do they use this stuff for anyway? Frosting? Desserts? All kinds of goodies. Do they make an orange? Nope, but here's fuchsia, Abby said. What? That's how it's pronounced, Noah. Fuchsia. I had no idea what fuchsia was, but it sounded like something you wouldn't want to step in. It's a hot reddish purple, Abby explained. Perfect for Operation Royal Flush. That was a code name for our secret mission to nail Dusty Muleman. We decided to use food coloring gel instead of laundry dye because the gel wasn't made with chemicals that would harm the sea life. Even better, it was highly concentrated, which meant that a small amount could dye a lot of poopy water. The plastic bottles were little, though, holding only one ounce. There was only one container of fuchsia on the shelf, so we asked a stock boy to go find more. How much do you want? He asked. Bring us all you got, I said. When we got to the cash register, the checkout lady gave us the skunk eye as she tallied up the total. What in the world, she said, arching an eyebrow, would you kids be doing with 34 bottles of food coloring? Abby smiled sweetly. We're baking a birthday cake, she said. Oh, is that right? A very big birthday cake, my sister added. And a very purple one, I see, the checkout lady said, handing us the bag of bottles. Wow, that lie was very easy to see through. Why do you have to act all suspicious? What does she care why you're getting the bottle? Tell her it's none of her business. On the way home, I kept looking behind us to see if we were being followed by the old pirate geezer. I couldn't stop wondering who he was and how he knew us. Abby said he was probably some gnarly old mate from one of the sports fishing boats, or maybe a bridge person who'd seen us around the island and overheard us calling each other by name. Well, whoever he was, I kept my eyes peeled. As we turned the corner of a street, somebody called out to us. It was Bull, of all people, standing in front of the house. He waved as we rode up, though Abby and I were too suspicious to wave back. I hopped off my bike and asked, What's up? Bull seemed edgy and uncomfortable. I could see Abby's teeth mark on his left ear, which is still all puffy and crinkled. He cleared his throat about five times before he actually spoke. Uh, I just came over to say that I was sorry. He said, real sorry. I set the grocery bag full of dye bottles on the sidewalk. My sister stood behind me and said, Is this some kind of sick joke? No way. Bull shook his head forcefully. I'm righteously sorry for everything, dude. He looked straight at me. All the times that me and Jasper hassled you, it was wrong, okay? Bogus and wrong. What's going on, Bull? Nothing! Why do you ask me that? Because all of a sudden you're Mr. Huggy Bear. It's weird. Come on, Underwood. Can't a dude say he's sorry and be real? What's the problem? Bull was getting frustrated, and I didn't want to push him any further. Okay, we're cool, he said. You say you're sorry, and I believe you. Excellent. Well, I don't believe you, Abby cut in. Either you're faking it, or you've just suddenly had a personality transplant. Bull's long, dull face pinched with confusion. What do you mean by that? What kind of transplant did you say? Never mind, I said. What about Jasper Jr.? Oh yeah, I almost forgot. He's sorry, too. Really? Then where is he? Bull hitched his shoulders. Dark half-moons of sweat had appeared in the armpits of his faded Harley Davidson t-shirt. He couldn't come, but he wanted me to tell you that it won't never happen again, Bull said. We won't be on you no more. Wow, that's two double negatives in a row. That's nice. Next you'll be sending me flowers. Naturally, Bull didn't catch on that I was being sarcastic. I'd really just like to hear Jasper Jr.'s apology in person, I said. Fat chance, mumbled my sister. She picked up the grocery bag and lugged it inside the house. Bull just stood there, sweating through his shirt and staring down at his enormous bare feet. It sounds strange, but I felt sorry for the guy. He quit school and left the keys to be a big baseball star, but here he was, back on the rock, bagging groceries and hanging out with losers like Jasper Jr. Come on, man, tell the truth, I said, even though it wasn't in Bull's nature. 
He looked up slowly. Underwood, who's the freaky old man? The guy in the woods? Just a friend, I said, thinking, a friend and total stranger. Where did he get that wicked bad scar on his face? He doesn't like to talk about it, I said, hoping that Bull would think that I knew him better than I did. Thing is, Bull said, he told me and Jasper to... Well, what? He told us to tell you that we were sorry for what we did for you, to you and your sister. He was very clear on that. Bull said, but when it came to the time, Jasper just wouldn't do it. He said he didn't care what some crazy old bush rat told him. What else did the old man in the woods say? I asked. Bull turned and checked over his shoulder, his eyes moving up and down the street. He said to not screw up again. He said he'll be hanging close, and we shouldn't forget that. Bull's visit now made sense. He came to apologize because he was scared not to. You'll tell him, won't you, Underwood? Tell him I stopped over and said I was sorry. When you see him again, I mean. Sure, Bull, when I see him again. Though I wondered if I ever really would. All right, now who is this mysterious pirate man? We will find out eventually, just not right now, so hold your horses. After lunch, my sister and I headed for Shelly's place to deliver the food dye and review our plan. Even though she came to the door wearing the nappy pink robe and carrying a plastic razor, we could tell that she was in better shape than she was the day before. She waved us inside and cheerfully resumed shaving her legs at the kitchen sink, a procedure that he never witnessed so up close and personal. The way Shelly did it wasn't quite as glamorous as it was in the TV commercials. I find it hard to believe he ever thought that anything could be as glamorous as it was on commercials. Whenever she nicked herself, she'd cuss like a biker and wipe away the blood with her pinky. Abby watched in fascination, but I felt kind of weird, so I turned away and pretended to be enchanted by the scummy aquarium. I could hear the razor blades scraping across Shelly's skin as she said, So, we're good to go? What about Billy Babcock? I asked. Don't worry, I got that all figured out. I was worried. If Billy was at the Coast Guard station when the sewage bill was reported, he'd tip off Dusty Mewman right away. It wouldn't take long for Dusty's crew to unhitch the Coral Queen and take her offshore, where they would flush the holding tank until there was no trace of the dye, and no way to connect Dusty's to the crime. So, Operation Royal Flush is where they would actually pour dye into the sewage tank. That way, the poopy water could easily be led right back to Dusty Muleman. Ever since he heard Lice was gone, Billy's been spending a lot of time in my bar, Shelley said, leaving $10 tips on $10 tabs. I thought he owed money for gambling. Why, why is he throwing more money away? Does he ask you out? Abby said, about two or three times a night. Shelley tossed the plastic razor into the trash basket, poured herself a cup of coffee, and sat down at the dinette. I'll handle Billy Babcock, she said with a confident smile. Now let me see what you got. Abby gave her the grocery bag containing the bottles of coloring gel. Shelly peeked inside and said, These are puny little suckers. Do you think they'll do the job? Well, it's concentrated, I started to explain. I know it's concentrated, Noah. I've baked a few treats in my time. Abby told Shelly about how we bought out the entire store. 34 bottles. Is that okay? No problem, Shelly said. I got a purse big enough to carry a Honda Civic. She held up one of the bottles. Ever used this stuff before? Both of us shook our heads. Well, it doesn't pour out like water. It's more gooey, like sunblock, so you really gotta squeeze. Silly, Shelly said, demonstrating on a capped container. 34 bottles is gonna take some time. I hadn't thought about that when we picked out the gel. Neither had Abby. See, it's just me working solo behind the bar, said Shelly, and Dusty does not like his customers getting thirsty. I get two 15-minute potty breaks every night, which isn't nearly enough time to flush all this stuff. Does that mean you can't help us, I asked. Now don't get your shorts in a knot, she said. I'll tell Dusty I got sick off the shrimp salad. What's he gonna do, make me go in a bucket? Isn't there a head near the bar, I asked. Abby poked me. A what? A toilet, I explained. On ships, they're called heads. Shelly's told us that the Coral Queen had three sets. One fore, one aft, and one up front in the wheelhouse, which is out of the question. That's only for the casino manager and the crew. Aren't you a part of the crew? Abby said. No, sweetie, I'm a bartender. They make me tinkle with the civilians. The more I heard, the more worried I got. The longer that Shelly was away from the bar, the greater the risk that Dusty or one of the goons would go looking for her. Other things could go wrong, too. What if the toilet she was using malfunctioned or got clogged? I decided on a slight change of plan. You're going to need more backup on board, I said. I'll take half the dye and flush it from a different head. Shelly tossed her head back. No, 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 James Bond Jr. It's too hairy. Just find me a place to hide. There's got to be somewhere safe. Hello? What about me? Abby interjected. Together, Shelly and I turned and said, No way. If you don't bring me along, I'll rat you out to Dad and Mom, my sister declared. I swear to God, Noah. She wasn't joking either. The veins on her scrawny neck were popping out. She was so ticked off. You couldn't do this without me, she said. If it wasn't for my 51 bucks, you wouldn't have enough dye to color a bird bath. I couldn't argue with that. This is getting way too complicated, Shelly said, slurping at her coffee. Look, we're only going to have one shot to take down Dusty, I said. So we better do it right. Shelly shot me a doubtful look. 
If you two brats get caught, we won't, Abby cut in. But if you do, we'll never mention your name, I said. That's a promise, double promise, said Abby. Shelley sighed. I must be out of my mind. It was almost 5.30 when Mr. Shine dropped off my parents at the house. They spent the afternoon at the courthouse, working out the final settlement for the Coral Queen case. Dusty Mulman had agreed to not prosecute my father for scuttling the casino boat, and in exchange, Dad had promised to pay back Dusty's insurance company for the cost of refloating the thing, cleaning it up, and fixing the diesels. The bill must have been really expensive, because the judge gave my father five whole years to pay it off. He also made Dad swear to not say anything bad about Dusty on TV, in the newspapers, or anywhere in public. So much of the First Amendment, my father griped as we sat down for dinner. Might as well walk around with a cork in my mouth. The important thing is that it's over, Mom said. Now maybe our lives can get back to normal. I didn't dare look at Abby for fear of cluing my mother that we were up to something. Dad was too bummed out to notice. Everybody in the county thinks I'm crazy anyway, he said sourly. Who cares what everybody thinks, I said. And who cares if you're crazy, Abby piped up. As long as it's a good crazy. She meant that as a compliment, and my father seemed to take it that way. It is unholy what Dusty is doing, a crime against nature, Dad went on. You know what he deserves? He deserves to be pain. That's enough, my mother said sternly. Someday he'll get exactly what he deserves. What goes around comes around. Dad snorted. If only. Mom's right, Abby said. Dusty can't get away with this stuff forever. My sister played it very straight. She's a slick little actress. Someday they're going to bust him cold. Don't worry, she said. Dad looked at her fondly and said, let's hope you're right but we could tell that he didn't believe that Dusty Muleman would ever be caught. My mother said, Noah, we need you to stay home with Abby tomorrow night. What for? I tried to sound annoyed, but I was really excited. This was the golden chance that my sister and I needed. Your dad and I are going out for dinner and a movie, Mom said. Woohoo, a hot date, teased Abby. We're celebrating your father's new job. Oh yeah, Dad said dryly. My exciting new career, towing numbskull tourists off the bonefish flats. Well, doesn't it beat driving a cab, I asked. True enough, he admitted. I want you both in bed by 11, not a minute later, Mom told us. You hear me? Absolutely, I said. Double absolutely, said Abby. 11 sharp. Neither of us would look Mom in the eye. I felt lousy lying to her, but honestly, we had no choice. Not if we hoped to catch Dusty Muleman red-handed. Or fuchsia-handed, to be exact. All right, don't miss the next part. The next part is really, really eventful and really good. I'll see you there.